Let's get started. Let's talk about robo taxis that always seem to disappoint us. Robo taxis. Every time we talk about self driving cars, they always come up. Recently, Tesla unveiled the Cybercab, sparking renewed interest from many people. Looking at this Cybercab, I can't help but think other companies might start feeling the heat. So, I've put together some thoughts on this topic. If you take a look at the Cybercab, you'll notice the name itself comes from the Cybertruck. The Cybertruck kind of looks like it jumped straight out of a cartoon or an SF movie, doesn't it? You can see that this car really follows that kind of vibe quite a bit too. The surface itself has that slightly opaque look, a bit rough, which gives off a vibe very similar to the Cybertruck. The design is somewhat similar to the typical Tesla look we're all familiar with. The way the doors open is quite captivating. It looks like something spreading its wings and soaring, and when shot from above, it turns out quite impressive. And the interior of the vehicle is pretty unique because there aren't any pedals inside, there is no steering wheel. It felt like a true robot taxi, uh, where the vehicle itself acts as a robot. Uh, inside you just sit back, watch the screen, and the passenger doesn't need to do anything. I can just sit back, relax, read a book, watch soccer, and even go shopping without a car. After shopping, I simply call the car, and it comes to me automatically. I can get in with a passenger, and at the back, the trunk opens up really wide. Seeing the trunk open, it seems like a two-seater. That's right. It's a two-seater. Only two people can ride, and there's a lot of debate about why it's limited to just two. Well, people often say that taxis are usually ridden solo, or at most with two people. Oh, that's right. Because the driver is riding. Since there's no need for a driver, it makes sense for just two people to ride. Also, every time self-driving robot taxis are mentioned, there's talk that it could even work as a moving hotel. There's been a lot of talk about this too. Since it's uncomfortable for many people to sleep together, some say the design might be intended for one or two people to sleep while traveling. This kind of speculation is also being discussed a lot right now. So how's the general feedback on this? The opinions are pretty divided. In fact, the idea of a robot taxi isn't something entirely new. Yeah, if we go by the concept, it should have been out by 2018 and all over the place by 2020, right? But a lot of people seem to get a bit confused between self-driving taxis and robot taxis. First, when we say autonomous taxis, we're talking about regular cars like Google's Waymo or Motional, which have steering wheels, pedals, and allow safety officers to step in during emergencies. These are typically referred to as unmanned autonomous taxis. Robot taxis, on the other hand, remind me of the robot shuttles from before. Remember those? Autonomous shuttles don't have pedals, steering wheels, or drivers. It moves entirely on its own, and you can think of that concept as being applied to passenger cars. In the past, there was something like the Toyota e -Pallet. That's right. There's e pallet Mobis, and ZEP, so many have been made. Back then, these started to appear in passenger car forms as robot taxis. Uh, but actually, what came to our attention even before Cybercab was Amazon Zoox. Have you heard of it? Yes. Zoox created vehicles with identical front and back designs, allowing them to move forward and backward seamlessly, showcasing the concept of a robot taxi for the first time. And if you recall, there was also GM's Cruise, a concept car based on the Chevrolet Bolt, which looked the same on the outside but lacked a steering wheel and pedals inside. Yeah, they created a concept. Oh right, I remember, yes. They tried to get a license in California with that, got rejected at first, eventually got it, but couldn't operate it properly, and had some issues. Basically, if you think of a shuttle turning into a car, that's what a robot taxi is. It's pretty simple to understand. There was also a RoboBand. RoboVan, right? Uh, the RoboVan came out this time, and it's basically a more stylish version of the robot shuttle we typically associate with autonomous shuttles. But its design seems to be pretty divisive. Some people say it's a bit over the top, while others think it has a very Tesla-like vibe. How are other companies doing these days? I mean, Tesla is at least talking about it, even if we're not sure when it'll actually happen. But other companies seem pretty quiet these days. Really, a lot, a lot have truly disappeared. Other companies have become quiet and many have disappeared. You briefly mentioned 2020 earlier, and that year became a turning point. Companies that were accused of fraud took the money and ran, or simply tried but lacked the technical capability, all disappeared. From an investor's perspective, all three are scams. Yes, it happened. However, as we know, only a handful of companies, Waymo, GM Cruise, Amazon Zoox, and Hyundai's Motional, are currently providing autonomous taxi services in the US. For now, there aren't many states where autonomous driving is allowed. In the US, Autonomous vehicles can currently operate in about 10 states. These include well-known locations such as Arizona, California, Nevada, Texas, and Florida. In addition to autonomous driving operations, the cities where autonomous transport services are available include San Francisco, Phoenix, Houston, Austin, and Las Vegas. However, among these, the cities actually offering paid transport services, 
are limited to just San Francisco, Phoenix, and Las Vegas. That's why the services are still very limited, and Phoenix was actually the first to launch them. In 2018, Google's Waymo launched its Waymo One service, and by 2020, it began offering paid transport services. In San Francisco, GM Cruise began offering paid transportation services in 2022, and recently, Las Vegas also launched its own paid transportation services, expanding autonomous driving options. But, you know, there's been a lot of talk about whether it's happening or not. Are they actually running services now? Doing even more now. The reason it doesn't feel very tangible to us is that Tesla does a lot of heavy promotion whenever something like FSD comes out. And it also gets a lot of promotion on its own. As for Waymo, uh, a lot of people are actually using it quite often, especially in San Francisco and Phoenix. Oh, really? Yes, it's being used a lot. And the paid transport services have contributed to what we commonly call accumulated autonomous driving data. It's over millions of kilometers. But they don't really promote or talk much about it. From what I've heard from someone living in Phoenix, People are so used to it now that they just decide whether to call an Uber or a Waymo like it's a normal choice. But actually, that's true. Waymo once talked about a valuation of 200 trillion one, but now they're only running about 100 cars, right? They're operating about 100 cars just within Phoenix. Even if it exceeds that, a company operating 100 taxis can't really justify a valuation of 200 trillion one. Maybe it feels a bit underwhelming compared to what they've built up. Maybe we've set our expectations too high. But if people living there are debating whether to take a regular taxi or a Waymo, it seems like they've gotten pretty used to it. They say they've gotten used to it. And I heard that they often ride at night. At night? Yeah, in the middle of the night, if you suddenly need to go somewhere, in the US, the roads are usually empty at that time, and taxis don't actually operate. Oh, they're heading home from work. That's why, if you call a driverless autonomous taxi at that time, it's safe and will get you there quickly. Lately, Waymo has been heavily criticized for being a major cause of traffic congestion. But at night, since there are fewer cars around, they say you can get to your destination much faster than usual. How does the fare compare to a regular taxi? The fare is pretty similar to Uber from what I've heard. The base fare is around $5. It's like the base fare for taxis in Korea, you know? Here, the fare is about 2 to $3 per mile. And strangely, there's also an additional charge for time, calculated per minute. Separately for distance, separately for minutes. So the per minute charge is about $0.4 to $0.5. For example, if you were to travel about 5 miles, uh, which would take around 15 minutes, for instance. So you'd have the base fare of $5, plus $2.5 per mile for 5 miles, and then $0.5 per minute for 15 minutes. So it's roughly similar to Uber or a regular taxi. It's similar. So it comes out to about $25. And since Uber, taxis and Waymo are all similar, people think, why bother with just Uber and end up using Waymo a lot? What's the difference between a robot taxi and a self-driving driverless car? In simple terms, it's the difference between whether someone can intervene or not. If you look at Google's Waymo vehicles, they actually have a steering wheel. They also have pedals. And an essential feature in autonomous taxis is the red emergency brake button. This was essential. However, in the case of robot taxis, such features are not present. This became possible because of MISA, right? The US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration changed the rules in 2023, stating that the button is no longer mandatory. As a result, even with level five, the red button used to be required, but due to safety reasons, now level five vehicles can operate without it. This has led to evaluations suggesting that the cybercab now has a much higher chance of actually running on the roads. The truth is, because we don't talk about it much or see it ourselves, experts seem to rate China's autonomous driving and robot taxis much higher than the US ones. Oh, there are many stories like that. In the past, when it came to China, we didn't really believe it. Even though people used to not believe that China could make something impressive, it seems like that perception has really changed recently. The recent Beijing Motor Show likely had a big influence, but China's EV and autonomous driving tech has greatly improved and is being heavily promoted. Especially those who have tried Huawei's cars say they can handle tasks like exiting ramps and passing toll gates, similar to Tesla's FSD. Doesn't that make you a bit uneasy? When asked, they said, Honestly, it seems to drive better than I do, so I wasn't nervous at all. With stories like this coming up, it seems the technology itself is now beyond doubt. And in fact, China started its driverless autonomous taxi service quite quickly. But before that, I'm more curious about calling this autonomous driving. The funniest term was level 2.99, 2.999999, which I think could really be a trigger point. 
The biggest difference between level three and level two lies in the issue of responsibility. Currently, they have already implemented most of the functionalities that are commonly referred to as level two or level three autonomy. As you mentioned, because of the issue of liability, Tesla still avoids talking about levels. The reason they avoid it is that they need to widely utilize systems like FSD and autopilot to gather data. But the moment they declare level three, liability becomes an issue and they're clearly mindful of that. In practice, not just for autonomous driving, but also for ADS, experience really matters. As a result, instead of calling it autonomous driving, referring to it as driver assistance or radar driver assistance might be better while continuing to enhance its features. It feels like level three, but is actually level 2.9999. In China, for example, though we don't get much information about it here, you know Wuhan city, right? Wuhan city is as famous for autonomous driving as it is for COVID. The Chinese government designated Wuhan as a specialized zone, encouraging companies interested in autonomous driving to test their technologies there. As a result, Wuhan now offers actual autonomous taxi services. As I mentioned earlier, Baidu is currently operating a paid taxi service in Wuhan, offering autonomous taxi rides as a business. In terms of fares in China, self-driving taxis are actually a bit cheaper than regular taxis. The idea is to get more people to use them, which helps gather data and more importantly, shifts public perception, something China is really focused on right now. In cities like Beijing that we know of, or Shanghai, in cities like Guangzhou and Shenzhen, you can see autonomous taxis quite easily. They are frequently on the roads, but in Beijing and Shanghai, paid transportation is actually not possible at the moment. Even so, the main reason they operate so many taxis is that it's one of the most representative cities. So both factors help reduce people's resistance to it and allow them to identify any inconveniences or issues while using it. That's why they're running so many in major cities right now to gather quick feedback and make improvements. It feels like it's been a while since we've talked about self-driving cars in Korea. Actually, level three autonomy was originally supposed to be integrated into both the G90 and the EV9. Honestly, even if it had been included, I didn't expect much. There are so many restrictions, like speed limits and conditions. So I thought, instead of pushing for level 3, wouldn't it be better to just improve level 2? I mean, level 3 has so many limits, like speed caps and specific conditions. In the end, it seems to have quietly gone under the radar. How's Korea doing these days? In Korea, if we break it down into self-driving cars and unmanned self-driving taxis, for self-driving cars, automakers are basically just focusing on development, without really considering commercialization at this point. Level three is pretty much as good as dead at this point. They're aiming to commercialize level four by 2027 and are actively working on its development. But whether that will actually happen by then is uncertain. For now, their stance is to focus on developing the technology first. As for self-driving taxis, paid services are not yet available in Korea. They're currently limited to trial runs. If you look at the chart in Seoul, many people are familiar with 42, right? It's part of Hyundai Motor Group, right? That's right. It's led by Song Chang Hyun, a former Nava Labs executive and now part of the Hyundai Motor Group. Companies like SUM and SWM are also operating in Seoul, with key areas being Cheonggyecheon and Sangam. In the Sangam district, for example, there are many autonomous taxis running around. If you actually get off at Sangam station and head to MBC or CJTVN, there's a set route for that. Many people have actually experienced it when going there. Have you ever been in that car? Tried them all, 42, SUM, SWM, and they each have their own uniquely different and distinct style. Everyone has a different driving style, right? Just like that, it feels like each company has different settings. So some of them feel more like a human is driving, while others can be a bit abrupt, like with sudden starts. If I were to rate them, I'd say it's still a bit hard for me to give them a score higher than 80 at this point. But when it comes to Gyeonggi-based companies like Yuka Mobility, I've tried those as well. There were some companies that did well in the second stage. One such company is Autonomous A2G, which operates in Pangyo, Bundang, Daegu, Chungbuk, and Sejong. In this industry, there's talk that they're sweeping through everything from the Ministry of Industry to the Ministry of Land and all the companies involved, right? It seems like they're doing quite well. They do face quite a bit of jealousy, but when I tried it, it really felt very similar to being driven by an actual person. And there's a company called Sonnet. They are really well too. This company isn't very well known, but its key feature is that it's really good at safe driving. When I rode with them, I hardly felt unease at all. What I find frustrating is that the speed is a bit slow. Also, autonomous driving usually involves expensive hardware like LiDAR, but they achieve solid driving performance with cheaper setups, which is impressive. 
They even enable indoor autonomous driving. Indoor autonomous driving. There was a lot of talk about how indoor autonomous driving is impossible without GPS, but this company demonstrated that indoor autonomous driving is possible even without GPS by using maps, radar, and similar technologies to build the system. But is there a situation where you would ride a car indoors? The importance of indoor autonomous driving is that later on, when you go down to an underground parking lot, GPS doesn't work there. That's right. Yes, we will have to come later in the self-driving car and park it, won't we? Why was I thinking about driving a car in the office? That's why such skills are also needed. In Jeju, there's a company called RideFlux. You know, when we usually land at Jeju Airport, we often head to Jongmun, right? When heading to the resort area, hotel shuttles or taxis are options, but taxis can be really expensive. But uh, this company provides free shuttles between the airport and Jungmun, and they've collected a lot of data through that. You know how, at ramps or intersections, when we need to make a right turn and cars keep coming from the other side, even drivers hesitate and keep checking, wondering when to go. Well, they've developed technology that handles those situations very smoothly. We initially got interested in self-driving cars and robot taxis because we thought they could be game changers. But as delays kept piling up, people started thinking, maybe it's just not going to happen. And even if it does, some feel like, well, the cars we have now seem good enough. So the question is, can self-driving technology or robot taxis really become a game changer in the automotive industry? I think it's not just the automotive industry, but also the transportation industry where this will be a massive game changer. Specifically, we've been talking about robot taxis, but another major area is logistics. In terms of logistics, this is already much closer to becoming a reality and is nearing commercialization. In the US, truckers are very well known and there are a lot of them. Trucking is a major part of transportation there and truckers earn quite high salaries. Plus, the unions in that industry are incredibly strong. If they go on strike, the entire logistics network in the US can come to a halt. That's where autonomous convoy driving, often referred to as platooning, comes into play as a potential solution. Like a train connecting several trucks together. Yes, only one person needs to ride. The concept is that only the lead truck needs a driver, while 10 or 20 trucks behind it can follow autonomously in a convoy. Beyond just platooning, full autonomous driving is also being heavily developed for this. If this becomes a reality, transportation costs could drop significantly. Lower logistics costs could lead to reduced product prices, which would have a major industrial impact. From the perspective of automakers, leveraging this technology could greatly increase the value of their brand, potentially driving up sales as well. As you said earlier, even with level 2.999, if it's a car people can trust and drive comfortably, if that becomes known, like with Tesla, where many buy it for FSD and Autopilot's tech edge, other companies could benefit similarly. That's how I see it. So actually, I am more looking forward to level 2.99 than low-level taxis. This is because I've been using driving assistance features for a long time, and I still find them incredibly useful. If they become even more advanced and allow me to drive more comfortably and with greater ease, I'd definitely be willing to pay extra for that, as people's perception gradually improves and they realize it's not as dangerous as they might initially think. It could serve as a natural stepping stone toward robot taxis. After all, if you suddenly encounter a completely driverless car, it's natural to feel somewhat uneasy at first. Yeah, it's definitely uneasy. That's why, even though it might have faded a bit from memory, I think this is one of Tesla's biggest strengths. Tesla started making electric cars in 2003, but spent over 10 years struggling. However, when the EV era arrived, they were the first company to lead the way. They're the only ones actually making a profit. That's right. So, instead of debating whether autonomous driving will succeed or not, we'll just have to wait and see who gets it done. In that sense, I hope Hyundai and other Korean companies keep pushing forward and give it their best effort. This was a look at autonomous driving and robot taxis, topics worth revisiting, especially with Tesla's robot taxi innovations in focus.